I'm just going to be real with each and every one of you in here. I don't often get nervous when I stand on stage, but right now I'm truly bricking myself. I think bricking. that if we scratch back the DeFi degeneracy and we peel away the meme coins and we take our NFT profile pictures and put them to the side just for a second and we look at the real core of crypto and the values of Web3 and what it stands for, um, it's going to be personified in this next speaker. Uh, a lot of us have given our time, our dedication, our money to building this industry in which truth is truly immutable. But this next gentleman and a personal hero of mine gave his freedom for it. So please give a big round of applause to Mr. Edward Snowden. Myself, I loved it there. Uh, if anybody hasn't done it yet, uh, you should absolutely try and go scuba diving, even if you don't know how. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll do it in the backyard pool, in uh, your hotel pool, whatever. Uh, it's amazing. It's quick, and then you know, get out to the reefs. It's it's a fabulous place. But haven't been there for a while. Probably won't be won't uh, be back for a while. Um, but look, we're here for, for for something more serious, and this was not the speech that I expected to give uh, when I set out to start writing. I've got to say as an industry, as a space, as an idea, as a concept, uh, we are doing very well. Uh, <laughs> at least in terms of income. But that's not how everything should be measured, right? You look at the charts today, uh, Bitcoin, anything, every, everything's up. It's fabulous, right? People are, are, are doing well, they're, they're euphoric. But there's a much different trend that's happening in the world, and I think they're intersecting in different ways. We have a lever of power in our hands today, and I think we're being asked how we want to use it. And I think most of us haven't reflected on um, the implications of that, what it means, where we're at, uh, and where it should be headed. So I've been rereading uh, John Stuart Mill's book, Liberty, uh, old book, I think 1850s, uh, but it is remarkable. Uh, how relevant it is today, and for any of you, uh, I, I think it is worth reading. Um, it might seem in the language uh, a little bit wooden, but I think you will be surprised how well the concepts have time travel to today uh, when we're talking about censorship, when we're talking about uh, mass audience, when we're talking about the influences uh, of the crowd on the individual. Uh, and of course, the state uh, versus the sovereign self or what we want to be the sovereign self. Now, people know me uh, most commonly, of course, the 2013 revelations of mass surveillance. Uh, I came forward, uh, and this was something that uh, many, many people knew was theoretically possible, uh, but they didn't realize that it was practically being done at the scale that it was. Uh, my government, and of course many other governments around the world, had in secret constructed uh, an architecture of oppression that in many ways simply hadn't been switched on. Uh, it was set to like a passive monitoring mode. They could, you know, stick their nets in the uh, flow of the ocean and pull up the bycatch, uh, which was all of our lives, all of our activities, all of our purchases, all of our reading, all of our interaction, the games you play, what time you're awake, where your phone is traveling, the cell phone uh, location uh, information, cell site location. Uh, information, all of these little things which um, individually didn't mean much, but in aggregate were a perfect picture of our lives. Uh, they helped the state understand us better than we understood ourselves. Now, uh, so many years later, we see this technology spreading everywhere. Private companies have it, of course, the social media companies, uh, and now they're starting to feed into artificial intelligence. Uh, engines sort of inferencing probable 
looks like crazy models. And, and, and what's that going to happen? What's that going to lead to? You know, of course, Facebook says they're not using this information for training yet. Uh, but their public models are incredibly good, uh, the open source models. Uh, the private models, like you know, OpenAI and whatnot, they, they won't even tell you what they train on. Uh, but there have been scandals here and there where we've seen you know, private data being revealed by a model. Maybe just because it has access to something through an API. Uh, maybe it's in the training set itself. Maybe it's leaked uh, tokens that were on uh, GitHub repo that it scraped. Uh, regardless, the idea is that we have more and more disparate little pieces of data that in the past would have been lost, they would have forgot, even forgotten, but now they're centralized, they're intersected, they're recorded, they're understood, and they're available. And they're available to more and more people, more and more hands. It's no longer just a classified world, it's everywhere. And to go back to John Stuart Mill, um, the, the very first paragraph of it uh, is describing civil liberty, uh, what that is. Uh, and essentially it's our, our, our freedom or belief. Uh, and where the domain of that uh, brushes up against the state's legitimate power to sort of shape and interfere, uh, there is a limit on it. Uh, and that's what civil liberty describes in a legitimate government. And then the idea is that it's supposed to be beyond anybody's authority to tell us what to do, how to live, what to think. Um, we have freedom of opinion uh, to a greater degree, uh, and freedom of action uh, to a certain degree, but a lesser degree. And the idea here, the, the commonly agreed, accepted principle, uh, is that our actions have more potential uh, to sort of step on the people around us, uh, to harm them. And so we make a, a kind of universal pact where you can believe whatever you want to, so long as it causes no harm to others. Uh, and even where it does, as long as it's quiet, as long as it's introspective, as long as it's not going out there and, and you know, uh, burning people's houses down, uh, it's okay. Now, we know uh, that this boundary has been trampled on in the past, but typically we consider these to be tyrannies. We consider these to be uh, illegitimate governments. And I, I think what John Stuart Mill might have called in the past, uh, something we're all familiar with, the Tyrian majority, has begun to become something new. Uh, that we're not really even aware of, but we see it happening and influencing every day. And that's that there's a new tyranny of mediocrity. When you feed everything into a probabilistic freezing machine, uh, whether that is an AI diffusion model, studies all the artwork in the world, at least that's publicly reachable, compresses it uh, into a you know, 3D latent space, and then you get it turns, and it searches in that, and it throws out what is the likeliest outcome of what you're describing. Uh, that is averaging down uh, human creativity. That is averaging down human experience. Uh, now, they apply a seed and some randomness to it. We can get uh, more original results here or there. But it's the same thing with the algorithm on social media, right? Uh, your timeline, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Twitter. I guess we're not allowed to call it Twitter anymore, but it's still Twitter. Um, it's the same thing with crypto, with meme coins, uh, with the trends, with the meta that everybody is chasing. Uh, and I think we need to reflect and the chains that are being placed on us uh, by the expectation of the average. You see that in politics. Uh, we just had a presidential election where, surprisingly, uh, the candidate that was pandering the hardest to the polls uh, was actually a conventional candidate, uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, this is the one that's poll testing, that's looking at everything, that's trying to uh, appeal to the most people, that's going, oh, we're going to steal the Republicans back by pretending to be Republicans, we're going to out-Republican the Republicans, uh, and then somehow they lost. Uh, and that's because it ended up being an election between someone who was uh, very obviously fake and someone who was more authentic, even though they're, they're lying half the time anyway. Uh, and. What this reveals, I, I think, is there is a, a hunger uh, 
for something original, uh, something that is true to itself, even if it's not true. Uh, true to itself, true in belief, right? true in, 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 in direction. Uh, and that's not a reflection on a, a candidate or an individual saying, you know, one of these people is wonderful, one of these people is not. Uh, it, it's a recognition of ourselves when we're reflecting, uh, or what we're looking at, how we're seeing the world, how we're seeing these timelines. We are viewing everything through a pane of glass. Uh, we're looking down at a screen, you know, in a restaurant, on a subway, on a plane. You see everybody like this, you know, looking at what's in their hands. Uh, and that, that's not just shaping our beliefs, that's shaping ourselves. It, it's changing us. We are being forced into molds. Uh, and everywhere you look, whether it's advertising, they are targeting this moving average that's constantly being shaped. They are holding it themselves. Uh, and, and you, the result is a grayscale good, uh, something that is not exceptional, but it's appealing you know, in many ways. They, they try to reach that. Uh, this, this, this global average is beautiful mid-journey images that no matter how different they appear to be, uh, eventually begin to strike us as obviously all the same. Uh, you go shopping, you look at reviews, you see people unboxing things, uh, and there's an increasing sense of sameness where they're incremental upgrades. They are improvements, right? They're a little better than last time, but there's a little less wow in the world. And I worry about this on the social level. I worry about this on the economic level. When you think about uh, social media, when you think about YouTube, uh, when you look at like the subscriber counts and things like that, when you look at authors, the books that are being read, when you look at movies, the, when you look at the TV shows that are being talked about, uh, it's a winner-take-all world. And this is not new, this is not revolutionary. People have heard about it, but what, where, where does that start to reach us? Um, I think what's happening is that there's a increasing the quality of health. And that sounds like a good thing, right? Go, oh, luxury space communism, right? Uh, but it's not that. Um, and in fact, it's something much worse. We have a quality of outcome, uh, but only for those of a certain income. And for the average, the income is declining because in a winner-take-all world, our share of the pie is constantly decreasing. Uh, whereas those who have the attention, those who are, you know, uh, the big attention getter, um, who are receiving the gaze of big eyeball, uh, they are getting it all more and more, more and more. Uh, and it's a question of what they do with it. Well, okay, so <laughs> the thought leaders of the world today are they leading us in the direction? Does the world feel better? Uh, to you now, politically, intellectually, than it did four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, a lot of people look back at the 90s now with a sense of nostalgia. Uh, and it's funny because back then it was a little bit fraught. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to take us all the way through uh, introspection endlessly here because I know we have limited time. But I want to argue uh, against that dynamic. Because I, I think that's what it's about. I think this crowd particularly can understand a little bit better uh, than the average. Because the reality here is, if you are in this room, you're not average. <laughs> you're weird. Whether <laughs> 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 you're trying to you know, get rich, which, which is a little bit uh, you know, a commonality that everybody has, is, you know, it's the hope, it's the dream. Uh, or you're actually working. Uh, to make something new, to try something new, understand something different. Now, you're putting the work in. Uh, and the reality of human experience, ladies and gentlemen, it is largely passive. People imitate. Uh, they look at the great figures. They look at the great uh, sort of stories of our past. Uh, they imitate and they emulate. They try to take something from themselves. They try to use it as their model. Uh, and eventually, maybe in themselves, through the process of experimentation, they find something new, they find something more that works for them, they find something that somebody else hasn't tried before. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is in fact what it's all about. I've got very young children, and they, they love to imitate. You give them a new word, they'll be saying it all day. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, recognizing the average, seeing what is around you uh, that is common, that is popular, 
means it is, in many cases, useful. In many cases, it means that it's effective, but not in all. And the power of this audience, the power of our space, the power of what we do, is recognizing that the systems around us have worked and maybe can continue to work, uh, but they have weaknesses. They have limits to their authority, legitimate or illegitimate, and we can change that. We do not have to accept the world as it is. We do not have to accept the world as we've inherited it. Whether we're talking about money, whether we're talking about finance, whether we're talking about creativity, we have to do something different than what we inherited, or what are we doing at all? The power of this game of life, in which we're playing our loud right now, you're in this room here, you know, you're in Thailand. Um, this is a fabulous thing. Uh, but there are limited rounds. We have limited days. And you have to recognize that when we're talking about the tyranny of majority, we have to find in ourselves a right to heresy. Uh, we have to violate the orthodox. Uh, we have to recognize in ourselves the heterodox. Uh, what is unusual about ourselves and nurture that? Uh, it's not to say that what's good for you is good for everybody. It's not that you want to make uh, everybody else is just like you. This is actually the problems of conflict in the world today. You see a lot of people worried that their you know, culture, their way of life is being erased. Uh, but it's this same dynamic that we've talked about. It is the oppression of the average. Uh, it is the fact that we are trying to be, we are trying to be stamped with a common template, the known good configuration. Uh, and we recognize in ourselves there's a part of us that doesn't fit, no matter how normal we are, no matter how ordinary we are, nobody fits in the cookie cutter perfectly. There's a part of the dough that will be cut off, that will be removed, that will be left, you know, as the crumb. And that is a loss to the soul. You know, that, that is the part of us, that part that doesn't fit, that's the most special part of us. And we want to rescue it. We want to make something of it. We need to recognize that within our community. We need to recognize that within our peers, and we have to be willing to, to fight for it. Because that difference is, as you know, I, I said, sort of reflecting on children, that's the root of progress. Uh, that is the core of the new method, the beating heart of the new meadow uh, that is on discover. Uh, we make it happen by being weird and by being committed to our room. It's not the thing where, you know, somebody points it out and we're a little bit embarrassed, we're a little bit reluctant, we laugh it off. You know, I'm not saying be a jerk. Uh, but I am saying recognize that the differences, the idiosyncrasies, the eccentricities of the self uh, are the most valuable parts of you. And the timeline is going to sand them off, right? Uh, you are going to get lights for the things that people agree with. Uh, and you are going to have a post that you know nobody recognizes, nobody comments on, maybe nobody agrees with it. But you keep iterating on the theme. You keep recognizing what is uh, unusual and special uh, about yourself, and you can escape. You can find your way out of that shadow conformer. Uh, you know, I, I, I was asked to opine on digital sovereignty, what that means, uh, and, and con uh, in policy terms, classically. Uh, the way we've seen it start to apply is governments trying to regulate the internet uh, within their own borders, saying, oh, you know, you guys can do this and that, uh, but when it comes in our territory, you have to answer to our government. You, know, you have to turn over your records to this, that, and the other. This was seen quite recently with Telegram, right? Uh, the marketed as security messenger, it certainly uh, wasn't before, but it especially is not so now. French government, and basically every Western intelligence agency has this poor guy uh, locked in a hotel room uh, in, in Paris, uh, threatened with jail if he doesn't cooperate. Um, but it's to recognize this, uh, just as everything else is, is trying to be erased, you know, in the form of large political uh, international blocks, uh, borders are trying to be erased. Uh, digital sovereignty is not um, this thing that they're uh, describing where, you know, we tr they try to regulate the internet for our purposes. Uh, digital sovereignty and the purpose in the, for the purposes of the individual uh, is where we recognize that there is a civil liberty 
for the internet and for our interaction with it, for our systems, whether we're talking about our money, whether we're talking about our connection, uh, whether we're talking about writing, whether we're talking about our reading, there are legitimate uh, limits on their authority to regulate. And the only way to preserve our digital sovereignty uh, is be cre to create our own systems uh, that are enforced through math, uh, that are enforced through uh, architecture, uh, that no level of law or influence or, you know, grabbing some guy at a hotel room uh, or everyone in this conference uh, throwing him in a jail cell uh, will be able to change. And this is the importance of things like the original uh, sort of Bitcoin idea, is that there is nobody that you can put under the gun to change it. Now, we've seen a lot of inventions, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, novelty and innovation uh, since then, and some of it's been powerful, some of it's been useful. Uh, but it's important to remember this whole principle. Uh, the things that we took for granted in the last decade uh, can no longer be counted on to be left alone. As the price rises, as we see you know, black rocks come into the community, as we see the big banks enter, as we see governments begin to talk about strategic reserves and investments, sort of the uh, arms race gets sparked in our domain, uh, where they're trying to compete for part of the new territory, we have to recognize that more and more encroachments are coming into our communities. And I, I don't care how strong you are, I don't care how principled you are, I don't care how brilliant you are. I, as long as you have a physical body that they can reach, uh, they are going to try their best to put their influence upon you. Uh, and whether it crosses uh, or when it crosses from that border uh, of the legitimate exercise of authority to the illegitimate uh, expression of it, will you be prepared? And that's the question we as a community need to ask ourselves. Uh, we need to ask these projects, and we need to think about uh, what happens tomorrow. For meme coins, you know, it doesn't matter. These things have no meaning anyway. They're, they're chasing the trend. It's uh, a sort of a popularity contest for a moment, for the round. It is a game. We recognize that for what it is. If you want to play, okay, fine, so long as you're not hurting anybody. Uh, it's the, the same thing as sort of uh, the freedom of opinion. But uh, when you're playing for real stakes, when it's no longer a game, when we're playing games of power, uh, you need to be ready. Uh, and you need to make sure that your digital footprint, uh, your, your digital homestead, uh, cannot be colonized, it can't be oppressed, it can't be taken out from underneath you uh, by any state. Uh, and with that, I'll say, let's open it up for questions. I bought this T-shirt. I had to buy it from a uh, had to buy it from a from a, from a Twilight fan site. Uh, but, but Team Edward, right? Team Edward, big time. Um, so it might look weird to the audience. I can see it here on the, on the screen. Um, so to my bosses, you can fire me if I want. But this is my copy of Permanent Record. I got it as soon as it came out. I've read it three times. It's a brilliant, amazing book. Ed. I think it's unlikely we're going to cross in the street this week, um, but I've written a little message, and I know it's not the same as you signing it, but if you could just give your approval, and I, look, you said be weird, right, so I'm just going to be myself. So I've written, uh, to David, my number one fan, keep fighting a good fight, sport, lots of love, P.S. the truth reigns supreme, and there's a little gap here that I'm going to sign with Edward Snowden if you say that's okay. Oh, please do. Oh. <laughs> Uh, look, it's got coffee stains on it. I've used it that much. All right, we have a, a few questions prepared, and I'm, I'm so excited to ask you them. Um, so you spoke about it a little bit. Uh, you can call it the regime change. I know some people around the world would say that. Uh, but given the U.S. election results, um, where do you think the U.S. goes now in terms of privacy and security? You know, he's talked about dismantling the deep state and gutting out the government. Whether or not he does, I don't know. But what direction do you think it's headed? Yeah, I, I mean, this is 
difficult. It, it, it's it's funny because the uh, yeah crypto community has really gone all in for Trump, but of course because he said nice things in, in some areas, but it's much more complex. Uh, speaking more broadly, uh, frankly, I think he's not uh, especially tuned into this, so it's not something that's going to be driven at the presidential level. But I do think there is a maximalism. Uh, for power, for influence, and that's common to all presidents. Uh, the question is just, you know, how aware are they of it? Um, I think whoever he puts in charge of this is going to, you know, crack it open as far as they can. Uh, but again, I, I don't think that's a Trump-specific thing. The reality is there is a global race right now uh, for intelligence agencies, uh, law enforcement broadly, to see all of the data that they have access to that I described earlier, right? Uh, it's any kind of digital record that's being created. Uh, previously, it was being ingested into these systems, these repositories, uh, that then had to have human algorithms applied to them. Uh, you read permanent records, so you're familiar with it, but things like X Keyscore, it's a search engine uh, for going through this, trying to pull out what you want. You, could, you would put in uh, what's called a selector, the, somebody's email address, their cell phone number, uh, the MZ or IM, uh, EI, uh, basically those are the identifiers for your cell phone. Uh, it's a key that's built into your SIM card or the handset, uh, which is known to your uh, telephone company, right? Uh, and that's reported up the chain. That means even if you like, change the SIM card on your phone, the handset is still the same. So they're all, this phone just had a different SIM card put in. They can sort of de anonymize you. Uh, through that, but the telco uh, would provide these things to the government in basically every country, right? Uh, and it's not broadly understood. This used to be available because of weaknesses in the operating system uh, to everybody who was putting apps on your phone. And, you know, Facebook was using it, everybody else was using it, and they're still finding ways to get it through special partnerships with the OS makers, Google or Apple. Uh, but basically, it's the big uh, OS makers now, Google and Apple, plus the telcos who have the best access to this data. But of course, those guys are very closely cooperating with the US government, or you know, your local jurisdiction with uh, their government. Um, and the question is what they're, what they're doing with this. Now, there's been limits on uh, their ability to understand everybody all the time. Right now, uh, the status quo entity is they will watch everybody all the time. That's what mass surveillance was about. Uh, everything that you doing was being reported and was putting the, being put in the machine. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily being taken out of the machine unless they had a reason to look at you. Then they dial back sort of the surveillance time machine and they go, all right, what's everything this person's done in the last five years? Uh, but now uh, it's possible, uh, that, and we just saw, I just read a headline last week about Palantir or, or something like that. Uh, is going to be signing a contract uh, with the government to create a classified cloud um, that is uh, applying basically AI analytics. They're putting these models onto classified clouds. And it doesn't say what the purposes are, but it's very obviously for crunching this kind of data. Uh, they want to train it on everything, uh, and they want to be able to say, you know, who looks anonymous? Uh, you know, we fed all the behavior of all the people we don't like in there. What's the common pattern? But what are the indicators uh, that make people more likely to be this and that? Who haven't we discovered? Who's not known to us? Look at everybody. Look at the whole human body uh, and pick out anybody who is weird. And this is another actually way uh, that your weirdness uh, is valuable. It creates a kind of herd immunity. Uh, if you are a little bit weird, but you're genuinely not hurting anybody, uh, you are reshaping the human average of activity. Uh, in a way that's a little bit more heterodox, uh, that provides protection for people who actually need it, activists, dissidents, journalists, um, where your, your weirdness pushes the boundary of behavior uh, a little bit out to make space for somebody else uh, to do something that frankly could change the world. Uh, this is not to say that you're not going to change the world, I hope you would. <laughs> uh, but it's just recognizing the small ways in which everything interacts. So anyway, to get back on the question and sort of summarize it, brief. Uh, the trend's going to continue. It's going to get worse based on what it is. Uh, but what's really interesting here, uh, and which, what I can't predict but I'm very excited about, uh, is the open sourcing of these models uh, has been very useful. Uh, and I think it's very rapidly increasing the individual capability. 
Uh, if you guys haven't used these things yet, uh, whether we're talking about uh, LLMs, whether we're talking about uh, generative imaging models, diffusion models, um, like the kind of mid-journey thing online, like chat GPT being the LLM thing, uh, don't use those online versions. Like, sure, they're fun to look at for like 10 seconds, uh, but the open source models now, you can go on GitHub and in like three commands, you can have this running, oh, what just happened there? Uh, hang on one second for me. Uh, Lost you. Yep, stand by. Stand by. Here we go. Now we're back. Uh, am I back? Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, thought, I thought you were getting too deep in. I thought the government was going to be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were like, oh, man, this is, this is too much. That's too much else. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the bottom line is you guys can do this uh, yourself. It's incredibly easy. Like uh, the whole reason is easy is all these academics who are not core programmers are doing it. Uh, but just using this, running this yourself where you don't have the same levels of censorship or if you do have the levels of censorship, you can remove them from the model, do it your own way, is incredibly empowering. You will understand these technologies much better and they're going to apply more in your life. I'm telling you guys, you don't understand uh, if you're not using it, you need to use this uh, because the technology is moving rapidly. Uh, you have these imaging models, like I said, diffusion models. You have the LLMs, the large language models, uh, which are like chat GPT, you talk them to them, you ask them whatever. Now they have vision models, which is basically an LLM plus an ability to understand images. You give it a picture of anything and say, what is this? It'll tell you. You give it a transcript of you know something you wrote on your hotel napkin and say, what does this say? Type it for me. Uh, and it, it'll do it. Uh, you know, they have language interpretation models. Uh, like Open Whisper. And when you start putting these things together, you can make your own live translation systems from languages you don't understand. You can do all of these things. You can write scrapers. You can write in a pro programming language that you don't understand at all because they'll write the code for you. Uh, and I, I, I just promise you, your human capability uh, will begin to sort of go a lot wider than you thought, and the sky's the limit. Now, remember this in the other direction. Something that concerns me is the fact that they have, you know, these audio analysis models now, um, where you just feed it an audio stream and bam, there's the text for a human. But back, you know, when this happened in 2013, Obama came out and he was like, no, 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 no one is listening to your phone calls. Uh, and this was supposed to be reassuring because everybody was thinking, like, you know, the German Stasi, this guy with headphones on there, like transcribing your call. Unless you were on the very top list, that was never going to happen to you. But that wasn't what we were accusing them of in the first place. The funny thing is uh, we were accusing them of using algorithms to uh, achieve the same outcomes without having to go to that step. Well, the reality is now they can actually have machine models that will soon enough in capability be able to do this. The global amount of phone calls won't be that large. And eventually they will be able to process all of this on the fly at line speed with these machines. And as soon as you speak, it is going to happen. But okay, you go, you know, that, that's on phone calls. I assume my phone calls are being, uh, you know, intercepted as they cross the global path. Uh, I'm a sophisticated crypto guy, right? Uh, well, guess what, guys? They're starting to build this stuff into surveillance cameras. Very, very, very crude implementations right now. Uh, but you can go buy, you know, a camera off the shelf from China, Huawei, uh, not Huawei, uh, Hike Vision or Dahua. Um, and they've got the basic capabilities like human detection, uh, like vehicle detection. It'll tell if a car pulls in your driveway or whatever. You know, you see it on ring cameras. This is very, very crude stuff, object detection. Uh, but what happens when they're able to bake these audio models into the chips on the camera? And it, it, the camera will offer you, do you want a transcript of everything that was said within the hearing distance of your surveillance camera? And it's cheap, and it's easy, right? And then they do this to every camera that's in the city. And suddenly, now, everything you're saying in public that's not on the phone is going into repositories. Maybe it's just on the camera. Maybe it's not leaving uh, anywhere in, in a freer country, but what about less free country? Uh, what about when those free countries become less free themselves? Uh, so anyway, the, the ground is changing very rapidly here. I would say the trend is to quantifying more of the world, ingesting more of the world. Uh, and it is becoming more interpretable. Our job as a space is to create uh, areas where they can't do that. Um, we're talking about uh, sort of private uh, transactions, what I've said in other talks, so I won't rehash it here. 
Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. I'll leave it there. Uh, next question. No, absolutely, it's brilliant. Um, right, this one's going to be a little bit spicy for the people in the room, I think. Um, but if you are glued to Twitter, now X, then you probably saw Edward uh, a few months back call Solana out for being centralized. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, did, why did you think Solana is centralized then? I mean, SBF. Um, <laughs> he's, he's not. He said it. He's not as much of a threat now as he used to be. But uh, Sam Bankman Fried, uh, the VC guys in the Hidden Channel, like if you look at Bitcoin, if you look at the uh, public ownership of it, it it's effectively 100 percent, right? They're like, oh, you know, there's uh, certain addresses that hold a big amount of the ecosystem. Yeah, but these are your largely <coughs> exchanges. These are ETFs, and then, of course, there's Satoshi, but his coins have never moved, they're never going to move. Um, but the idea is that everybody got uh, sort of a fair chance at that. It's, it's open, it's distributed. Uh, when you look at node ownership, uh, I thought the network grew. It was um, a bunch of people running these things on laptops. Now, in fairness, uh, it's become a lot more centralized now. We have mining industries, it's much more competitive because the difficulty rate is shot to the moon. Um, but when you look at a lot of these competing systems, right, uh, they're run out of data centers by professional companies, by VCs, uh, who own half of the ecosystem. Uh, when you look at the coin distribution on Solana when it came out, um, the you know public sale for it like didn't exist. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm sure somebody on Twitter will complain. It's uh, okay. that, that's your right. Be weird, guys. Um, but look, a, a lot of people get into this because they're they're trying to defend the value of Solana, which frankly I don't care about. I don't care if Solana uh, you know goes to a thousand uh, or if it goes to ten. Um, and I, I don't think that's how we should be evaluating. Uh, we, we can't bypass the fact that that is the case. Um, but the bottom line is a series of choices were made uh, in the architecture of that and many elements. Like, I didn't mean to, I should have called up Solana specifically. I said I wasn't going to name names. I did it anyway. It was a mistake. Uh, I'm sorry to anybody I offended. But it is absolutely more centralized than many of its competitors. People will argue it's decentralized enough. Um, well, your entire network goes off sometimes. As it happens, a lot of people pressing it. That's great. Right? Uh, Solana does have low, low cost of transactions. That's great. Uh, it is fast. It's effective. It's efficient in many ways. That's great. Uh, <laughs> but what happens when you start stepping closer to that world that I just described uh, throughout this talk in many ways? Um, and you have more and more states starting to go, all right, what if we can take this ecosystem and make it ours. Uh, what if we want to, you know, stop all these transactions, stop the network entirely? What if, you know, you can't do that with some points, you can't with other systems. Now the Solana guys go, well, it's distributed enough now, it's decentralized enough now, there are all these, uh, you know, um, different jurisdictions we're dealing with. Okay, maybe, fair, all right. Uh, but you can't say it's, it's more decentralized than these others. Uh, come on, guys. Anyway, that's it. No, I appreciate that. I, I think collectively, as an industry, like there's a lot of people in here that look yeah. Solana, me included. Um, we're trying our best, right? And, and it's difficult with the with the incentive alignment and whatnot. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I could do this for the next five years, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think you can. Uh, I don't think these people want to stay for that long. Uh, but I am pretty much. A, a human optimist, right? Uh, I know it's it's a scary world that we live in, and, and the things that you've warned us about, and you continue to do so, um, they can be really daunting, right? So, what if anything, and I hope Neil will be a part of it, will prevent this onslaught of AI going the same route as Meta, as you know, Twitter, formerly, and perhaps even now, and, and these big Web two companies that depend on surveying their users to survive. <laughs> uh, the only thing that stops from going in that direction is us. I mean, that's the only answer it, it ever is. Um, power tends to centralize. Uh, networks tend to centralize. Uh, <laughs> crypto has tended to centralize since the beginning. Um, because there's a benefit to be 
had, right? In the good years, centralization is uh, an advantage. It's only in the hard times that you realize the benefits of decentralization. I mean, everybody in this room who's really followed Bitcoin from the beginning would understand that if Bitcoin had not been decentralized, uh, Bitcoin wouldn't exist. I know it would have been stamped out, everybody involved with it would have been arrested, you know, it would be a story of news 10 years ago. Uh, just like Liberty Reserve and all of these other uh, alternative currency implementations. Uh, when it started to be a threat to what was considered to be the government's uh, monopoly domain on you know, their powers, um, the boot would have come down and it would have stomped hard. Uh, with AI, uh, they didn't start. Uh, this is a power that they are attempting to entitle themselves to. Who's the they? I'm talking about states broadly here. Um, corporations, of course, are the ones who have the largest technical advantage. Uh, they have the intellectual advantage because they're the ones developing this. Uh, and as the first movers, uh, they are having a large uh, sort of head start in terms of access to data sets and whatnot. I think the way you fight this, uh, and sort of a weakness in the AI open source model that I've been uh, praising so highly earlier, uh, is we are getting the weights from the models, right? These are the things that allow you to run inference uh, against what these guys have trained and then released to us, which is useful. And like I said, it's amazing how this stuff. Um, but you can't replicate the work. Uh, and in many ways, you can't extend the work. You can't improve the work uh, in quite the same way because you don't have the original data set. I think if we really wanted to improve this, one of the best ways uh, to deal with the AI inequality uh, would be to say, look, if you guys are going to publish a model, or not publish a model, if you're going to use a model uh, commercially, you have to make the data sets, right? uh, not just the weights. Um, and of course, you know, no company in the world is going to do this. They would have to be forced to do it kicking and screaming. Uh, and this is where a lot of people would, would argue against me, but you don't own that. It's not yours. You can't tell people what to do with it. Uh, and this is where the hard questions of government come down, right? What is a, a, a legitimate and illegitimate? of authority. Um, are we supposed to be left in the playing field? Uh, or are we supposed to be creating space for people to do what they want when they have an advantage to allow them? But, because they are the ones who started it, right? They're the weirdos. They're the ones who took the risk. They're the ones who gambled. We've been you know, up in that all day long. Uh, who are we to now change the rules uh, mid-match? Well, the question, of course, is when it comes to disparity in outcome uh, to a certain level, we are in a in winner-take-all world. Uh, do we want to let there be uh, a winner of the world? Uh, because fundamentally, at the end of the day, like we, we love each other, we love people uh, of fear, dangerous, dangerous animals. Uh, and just like John Stuart Mill was writing you know, 200 years ago, uh, just like opinions and actions, there is a difference between them, and there are lines where there is a legitimate role for government to interfere. Uh, when our actions start to infringe on the lives of others. How do we control that? Um, recognizing that people will strive for the best for themselves, often at the expense of others. How do we ensure some basic level of fairness? Uh, and I think when we see the power and the promise of AI, uh, the, there are going to be real questions about the, the future. Uh, the problem that I ask is that the government, of course, knowing the government, seeing all the legislation that they've provided over the last 50 years, they're going to construct this legislation in the worst possible way. Uh, they're going to be guided by the very com companies that, that we need to restrain. Uh, their lobbyists are going to uh, shape and be literally authoring the legislation. They're going to rubber stamp their legislatures. It's then going to rule us. Uh, and so I, I think we have really have a lot of work uh, ahead of ourselves to go, all right, with this great set of disadvantages, how will we catch up? How will we retain an edge for ourselves if all these data sets are coming to be locked away, if increasingly the weights are going to be locked away? Um, and we're basically fighting uh, a sword fight with a toothpick. But that's where ingenuity and youth, I hope, will rescue us. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people in the room. Some of you are younger than others. You know, I used to be the youngest guy in the room. Uh, now I'm not, uh, but that's, you know, that, that's the story of humanity, that's how it goes. Uh, for you uh, out there, whether you're working in crypto, whether you're working in AI, whether you're working uh, in both, one of the interesting things about AI is it's getting easier and easier to train. 
Um, we're never going to have equal resources. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can shake down uh, some of these VC guys and free up their money uh, without giving up the soul of the project. And, you know, that's my hope for things like Solana. Uh, Solana was basically born in prison um, because of how much VC money they took in this, you know, VC uh, project from, from the get-go. Um, but maybe it can become something. I hope so. And, you know, the VAC definitely hope so because they're getting rich off of it. Um, but the, 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 the bottom line is we've given away a lot of ownership of ourselves, of our online lives, of our digital footprint uh, that we didn't know we were giving away uh, because we clicked OK in the terms of service. Even though that wasn't a choice, even though you can't go you know, throughout your life without clicking OK and continuing your phone turn it off the first, uh, very first time. It doesn't matter who you bought it from, you got to click OK to continue. you got to click OK to sign up. you got to click OK to log in. Uh, and all of these terms basically make you give up more and more, and more of yourself. That's not a choice. Uh, that's something that's forced on you, because you can't get through life today without having a phone. You can't get through life uh, without passing all of these gates that are constantly being uh, placed in front of you. You're being asked to sign up to more and more subscriptions. You're being asked to sign up to more and more rules. Uh, and, and a little bit more of the life that we used to take for granted is now being you know, placed beyond these barricades. Uh, and that's been the direction of the future. My hope is that the people in this audience, and audiences like it around the world, uh, find ways that we can tear down these barriers, uh, that we can pierce through these barricades, that we can connect with each other, no matter where we are, no matter what we think, no matter where we started, no matter what we have. Uh, and without becoming alike uh, in terms of average, and instead of becoming uh, molded by these systems, pressed into the, you know, the, the cookie cutter, uh, we have a shared fraternity, a diversity, uh, that reaches beyond language, beyond culture, beyond borders, beyond beliefs, and recognizes there are commonalities in the things that we love. There is a global average in the things that we like, and that's okay. There are things that are appealing to everybody, and that doesn't mean we hate the popular, right? Uh, but it does mean we respect the difference, and we embrace it and we nurture it so that we can have new things, that we can have better things, without losing our appreciation for the things that we inherit. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. They asked me not to sweat too much, but you are so fucking rock and roll. Uh, I think a lot of people in here would agree, you know, 10 years ago or so, you, you were the catalyst of a, of a revolution, and not everybody in crypto or Web3 is, is here for the same reason, but there's certainly a significant impact of people uh, who are here to be that group that you were just talking about, and to be the toothpick holders to take on uh, the sword-wielding uh, warriors of big tech and big government. Now, I would love to talk about it all day, Edward, but I'm afraid we are out of time, brokenheartedly. Is there anything else you want to say uh, before we wrap it up? Just stay free. Stay Thank free. You so much. Good. Good.